Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Unley Park Baptist this morning. You are very welcome here, whether you're a long-term part of our family or whether you're visiting, whether you're online. Welcome. We are here together to worship God as a body of Christ. So let's do that together. We are... It's, it's in that funny time, isn't it, where we... Um, we kind of, I don't know, if you're kind of on holidays or you're kind of not, and getting back into the first part of the year. Um, I wanted to focus this morning on this complicated fact. Jesus loves me. In 1962, at the University of Chicago, a well-known theologian called Karl Barth was asked in a question and answer time, what, how, if you were to sum up your whole theology, how would you sum it up? And he said... Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's been quite a... You may have even heard that before. I can see some of you smiling. I mean, the the even funnier part is that this guy then spent the next 36 years writing his theology of, wait for it, six million words long. But in the end, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, contains everything we need to hang on to day to day, doesn't it? So we're going to sing those famous words... If you'd like to stand with me. Jesus loves me.
Lord Jesus, our Saviour, we thank you for this simple but amazing truth that you love us. Not that you just tolerate us or you accept us or you let us in because you think you should, but you love us. You love us. You like us. And we praise you for that. We can't understand it. It is marvellous. It is wonderful. This is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Lord, we want to soak in that this morning. Let us know with our minds and know with our hearts just how much you love us. And help us to respond in love to you. In your name we pray this morning. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, good morning. Good to see you all. My name's Jason. For those who haven't met me yet, and uh, hopefully I can rectify that if you haven't, uh, and I'm, I'm a lead pastor here today. Look, I, I, see, I see a co- couple of notable mentions in terms of coming to church today. So I want to wel- us to welcome Harry and Ashley Peary, who got married a few weeks ago. <laughs> Congratulations. Very exciting. What was your honeymoon night? Don't tell me. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's good. Now, just for those here, for folk online, you don't need to worry about this, but the tour down under kicks off at 11.30 down at King, King William uh, Road. So what that does mean for us is your car probably won't get off this, out of this block if you park somewhere in there before 12 o'clock because they've all blocked the streets off. Uh, uh, pretty soon, so uh, you'll just have to hang around for morning tea uh, after the service, which is uh, we're all looking forward to. I, I um, want to say to us that I, I've been we're working a bit on on um, kind of people connecting to our church. So if you are interested in uh, knowing more about the life and ministry of our church, then you can scan that QR code there, and it'll take you to a. Uh, a little form and, and you can fill that out and then we can keep in contact with you. The other thing that um, we try to promote in our church is people uh, being part of our uh, version Bible app and that's this one here, I think. And uh, you can find us, I believe, though I know some of you are having troubles. So uh, if you're having troubles, I'll, I'll do tech support. I'll be at the front of the church and you can say, help me with my iPhone, it's consistently the iPhone that is the trouble. Help me with my iPhone because I can't get into uh, the version Bible app thing. Last night I was at the Iranian church and they, uh, they kicked off for the year. And we're really um, wanting to support them as a church. The thing that I was, I was, they asked me to preach and the thing that they asked that I felt I should speak to them about is that they have a particular place in the purposes of God in Adelaide to reach Iranians, right? To help Iranians follow Jesus and to reach Iranians. My Farsi is not great. Your Farsi is probably not great either. But um, we're really praying that God will use them this year to reach the two and a half or 3,000 Iranians in Adelaide Many, if not most, don't know Jesus. I believe they estimate rather around 120, 150 people would be, call themselves Christians. There's a lot of people that don't know Jesus. And the thing about Iranians compared to Australians is Iranians are spiritually minded. Australians generally, as you may have noticed with your mates, generally don't think about or talk about especially as spiritual matters. But Iranians do. They're very spiritual-minded people, and they're often seekers. So um, if you're praying for them, then I'd love for you to pray that they have fruit in that ministry. Uh, There's about 12 of them who are committed to the cause to reach uh, all those folks. So I'd love for you to pray for them. The other church I'm going to tonight is the Aboriginal Berean Church, and we partner with them. And tonight they're uh, actually inducting a guy called Jack Haradine, Pastor Jack Haradine, who works for Bush Church Aid. And he'll be working across South Australia supporting Aboriginal people in regional communities. Um, He's an evangelist, he's a preacher, he's a pastor. 
And I'll be going along there to live stream and to kind of be part of all that. There, there are these two churches our church has, well, has a strong connection to, either because they meet in our building or because at least your pastor is strongly connected to it. Um, I would love for you to think about whether you can get to know at least one of those churches. So that would require rocking up on a Saturday night at 6 o'clock, that's where they meet, just in this room, and they worship God. You won't understand probably many words. Um, I understood my words last night because I was speaking in English, but the rest was in Farsi. But they will understand your heart, and you'll actually really appreciate their heart too. And or, or ha, gotcha. Or you could come along on a Sunday night, and I go on the third Sunday night of the month, and come with me to the Aboriginal Breen Church. I would love for you to not just hear about it, but actually experience it, meet people, be friends with them. Uh, right, so we've got some birthdays I need to mention. Hey, Millen, your wife's birthday's this week. Got that under control? Happy birthday, Cindy. Uh, then, ma'am, it's your birthday this week. Happy birthday to you. I'm just going to roll through. Lynn Long's birthday, uh, Scarlett's turned five. I cannot believe that. Uh, Kim Harris's birthday this week. Bethany's birthday, Rosie's birthday, Harry Hawke's birthday, and Asha Battersby. I can't see her. She, she's not here. Oh, there. Okay, well, happy birthday to her. So if you see these people around the building or if you are able to text them, why don't you do that? Um, last, I think last thing, the last thing to kind of cluster together is our kids' church kicks off next week um, and... Today we have our holiday program, but we're kicking off next week, so uh, we're looking forward to that. We, we're calling it now Unley Park Kids, um, and I'm still getting used to that. Uh, then youth group kicks off on fr- the following, the first week of school, um, Unley Youth, and then tomorrow we have our Space Quest or Kids Quest holiday program starting tomorrow, and uh, we're really looking forward to that. I'm, I'm t- telling you all these three things because we need you to pray for tomorrow. Kids Quest, yeah? Is that right, Sarah? We need you to pray. Um, if, if people want to send, if they haven't registered, they, can they send, come, just rock up? So that's for uh, ages 4 to 11, and it's a day program. But we, we need you to pray for tomorrow. We want you to particularly also pray for our children, our youth, and our young adults as all that starts. To help us do that as a church, Chris has asked if we can have a prayer meeting next Sunday night at 7 o'clock, 7 to 8 o'clock. So we're going to pray for the kind of first third of our church and that God will do amazing and powerful things in their life, that they'll love Jesus for their whole life. And uh, we'd love you to join us in that. So we'll be in this room here or somewhere, in the building somewhere, um, and we'll be praying from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock next Sunday night. There you go. There's lots of things to kind of be aware of. Are we going to... What am I going to do? Is it you? Okay. I'm going to get Chris up. He's going to talk to us about... Well, the kids talk. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. Does anyone that uh, defines themselves as a kid want to come and join me on stage? I see a couple in the audience. I see a couple that might define themselves as kids as well. You're welcome to come on up, come on up, guys. I say more, come on up. Oh, awesome. G'day, guys. How's it going? Yeah, good. Who's excited for school to go back? Everyone. Oh, the parents. Hey, g'day, guys. Parents are excited for school to go back. Um, well, before school goes back, we've still got another couple of weeks, uh, and at school you guys might learn some new words, and I've got a new word for you this morning. Are you guys ready for it? No. I th- that's, that's, that's good preparation. The word is foley. Has anyone heard the word foley before? One, oh, couple in the audience, foley. Have you guys ever heard that word? No? Okay, I'll give you a clue. It's got something to do with this thing in this mysterious box. You 
guys ever seen one of these before? Wait. Kind of hear that. So you have these for movies and TV shows, and it's what they use before they start. Oh, you've seen that? On TV, perfect. Yeah, they say cut. Oh, look at you guys. You guys are ready for Hollywood. Uh, so Foley has something to do with this. Does that give you any ideas? Anyone want to take a big guess? What if I told you it had something to do with sound? Any ideas? Well, that's a good guess. This is a Foley, the clicking of that. Actually, that, that's, a, that's a very close answer. So maybe for some of the adults that are wondering what Foley is as well, Foley is when you create the sounds in movies. So maybe, for example, um, there's a sword fight and uh, you're like watching it and it sounds like the swords are making all the noise, but actually they probably can't get a very clear sound when they're using their little microphones. So then someone in a studio finds other things that will make those similar noises. Um, so maybe they've got, uh, I don't know, I don't know what makes sword noises. Um, Maybe if you're squelching something, they might use a watermelon instead of, like, mud, that kind of thing. Today, we're going to do some foley. That's really the point of this story. Uh, and we're going to make some of our own sounds. Does that sound all right? Okay, cool. I think you guys are going to be awesome at it. I'm a little bit concerned about the big people in this room. Is that, do, do you feel the same way? Do you feel concerned for them? You do. I got a thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, so I think we're going to encourage the big people to get involved as well because it's good to challenge ourselves uh, when something's as easy as it is for us. Okay. Today's story that needs Foley is Elijah in 1 Kings. And what's happened is Elijah uh, has challenged um, some other prophets who worship a different God. And he said to them, um, he's like, look, your God's not real. My God is I'm going to set you guys a challenge to bring fire from heaven, right? You guys tracking with me? Yeah, okay, nice. Um, and then the other uh, prophets have nothing, no fire from heaven. Elijah, fire from heaven. So then he says, uh, okay, these other prophets, you guys um, aren't going to stick around. Uh, and he um, ends up getting a lot of trouble with the king and his wife because they worship this other God, and they're not too happy with Elijah making them look a little bit silly. This brings us to our story. Elijah has run away, because they want to kill him, and uh, he is hiding out, and God's, God sends him to a cave. Where are my notes? There we go. Um, and this is where our story begins, and we're going to start making some folly. Okay, in the cave, the Lord said... Go out. Oh, stand on the mountain in front of me. I am going to pass by. Does that sound a little bit kind of like God voice? Maybe. Okay, here we go. As the Lord approached, a very powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Okay, to make the wind, we're just going to start. Can we all do like just a little click? A little click. We've got to be COVID safe. That's why we're not all making noises with our mouths right now. Okay, so we've got to click. Oh, that kind of sounds like wind. And then if we start um, rubbing our hands like that, the wind's kind of picking up. Oh, do you guys hear that? And then if we start rubbing our legs. Wow, listen to that wind. That's crazy. <laughs> Such a crazy wind. Um, wait. Cut. You guys, you guys did good. Um, okay, so a very powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Um, the wind broke up the rocks but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. Okay, so for this one, we're just going to start kind of gently tapping our feet. Just gently, and then slowly working it up. Getting a little bit louder. Oh, let it out! Yeah! Okay, cut. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire came. Now, to make the fire, we're going to go through the wind and build it up into the earthquake. So we're going to start like this. Okay, and then this half of the room, can you do the feet? We're going to keep going with our hands. And then this part of the room, do the feet and the hands. Whoa, listen to that fire. 
and cut. Beautiful job. Uh, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was a gentle whisper. Can you guys do it? Just talk to yourselves and just say a little whisper. Just say, g'day. How's it going, dear mate? How are you doing today? When Elijah heard it, he pulled his coat over his face and he went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. And you know, when he did that, God had some really cool things to say to him about what to do next. I wonder if sometimes we expect God to only speak to us in a loud voice because he's God and he's big and he's cool. I don't know about your parents, but when my dad sneezes, it sounds like there's going to be a hole in the sky. <laughs> Do you want to know what that sounds like? It sounds something like this. That's literally what he sounds like when he sneezes. Do you, any of your parents like that? Your grandpa is. <laughs> and maybe it's a grandpa sneeze. Oh, your grandpa always frightens dad. That, that can happen. Uh, and so sometimes we expect God to sound like my dad's sneeze. But more often than not, God's waiting for us with a gentle whisper so that we're listening. What are some ways you think that God might speak into our lives? Oh, is that an idea? No? What about when we read the Bible? God can speak into our lives? Have you heard that one before? When we pray. That's a good one. When we pray. What about when we look out at a big, big storm or we look up at a big, beautiful tree? Sometimes God can speak to us through that, yeah? Or what about what we were doing just before we started doing kids' talk with all those instruments? Praising, yeah. Sometimes God can speak to us in there as well. So it's good for us to take some time sometimes to look for God in the small ways and not just in the fire, in the earthquake, and in the wind. That was the third one. Maybe let's say a prayer, and then I'm going to send you guys out to a holiday program with Tanya. It's going to be awesome. Dear Jesus, uh, thank, you for, um, thank you for being with us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for all the big and the small ways that you make yourself known to us um, to show us how much um, you are inviting us into your love. Uh, may we be listening to your voice in our lives. Amen. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to send you guys off with Tanya, Gemma, and Emily to holiday program. You ready? Set. Go. We're going to be taking up our offering. Uh, this week we are... Uh, we'll be collecting for Engage Work Faith at the end of the service, but this is our regular offering for our church's ministry. So um, I might just ask the musos to play a little as we do that. Thanks, Ashes. We sang this song quite a bit around Christmas time and it has a sense of welcoming the King, a sense of majesty, but that's not just for Christmas. And so I thought we'd sing this song today. We've been talking about how Jesus loves us, but that same Jesus is the King on the throne and he shall reign forever and ever.
as we come before the throne, the thing to do is to pray. And the prayer we're going to pray today is the prayer that Jesus taught us, the one we call the Lord's Prayer. We're going to pray this slowly, a phrase at a time, to give us a chance to add in our own prayers silently. Let's begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. going to come and bring our Bible reading. Thanks, Helen.
The reading today comes from 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 9. It's on 255 in the Pew Bibles. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I, by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Bathsheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around. And there by his head was a cake of bread, broken over, baked over hot, hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. Thanks be to God. Good morning. And uh, happy Lunar New Year to those of you that celebrate Lunar New Year. Um, thanks a lot to Miranda and the team. That was fantastic, really special time of worship, and I really appreciate that. Um, I did want to uh, welcome Peter and I think it's Lauren, uh, who just sat... Laura. Laura, sorry, my apologies. They've just moved from uh, New South Wales, and Peter's the new pastor at Glen Osmond Baptist. Uh, I feel I had a part to play in that, Peter. I, I preached um, the week before they voted, and you got a unanimous vote after that, so you're welcome. Yeah, But we are excited to have you guys uh, ministering in, in Adelaide and really pray for God's blessing on your ministry. Uh, I wanted to uh, look today, as we continue this passage on reflecting forward, on uh, the, the passage that... Uh, Helen read for us, and then the section that Chris uh, presented in the, in the kids' talk. And Jason, uh, when he asked about preaching and whether there was something sort of learnt from the year before and looking to apply to the year ahead, uh, this passage on Elijah um, came to me straight away in terms of God's provision and presence and also his tenderness and intimacy. I... Uh, heard about two old guys that, that were fishing uh, under a bridge. And uh, while they were fishing, a, a funeral procession came across the bridge. And this guy, Fred, put down his rod, took off his hat and put it on his heart and bowed his head. And he did that until a procession had passed across the bridge. And his mate said to him, Fred, you're such a, a tender and compassionate guy. That was really moving uh, to see the level of respect you had for... Uh, this funeral procession that was going across. And Fred said, well, I was married to her for 45 years. <laughs> um, pro probably a low bar for tenderness and compassion. Uh, and God's tenderness and compassion, thankfully, goes a lot further than that. Um, just to set the scene, uh, the, the high point for Israel uh, was really under the kingship of David and Solomon. M militarily, it was under, under David. They just conquered anyone that was before them. And then in terms of economic wealth, culture, arts, building of the temple, that all happened uh, under Solomon. But the, 
underside of that was that Solomon allowed idolatry to come in uh, via foreign wives, and it led to a decline of Israel. And God's judgment was he split the kingdom in half, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And the book of Kings, which Helen read from, records their history, the history of the kings. So Elijah was living in a nation that was really in decay. And King Ahab ruled 58 years after the divided kingdom. And he reigned from about 874 BC. And things were getting worse. The last seven kings were recorded as being evil. And now Ahab was married to Queen Jezebel. And she wanted to stop the worship of Yahweh. And she was the princess of Tyre. Uh, the daughter of the king, and the marriage was to form an economic alliance. And Jezebel was very strong, and Ahab was fairly weak, and allowed her to reintroduce worship of Canaanite, and particularly the Canaanite god Baal, which David had removed that worship previously. And she wanted to stop the worship of Yahweh. She wanted to kill the prophets. And Baal was the most popular Canaanite god. He was the god of fertility, both of humans uh, animals and vegetation so they looked to him for prosperity and he was also the god of weather and when we see Elijah it's interesting to note the first thing that really stands out is he had a great struggle after a great victory Chris talked a bit about that great victory that he had Elijah kind of appeared out of nowhere uh, announced a drought on behalf of God and then God told him to go and hide and during that time, Jezebel was killing off prophets of God. Uh, in, in the next slide, uh, that's actually Mount Carmel, which is where this great challenge happened. Um, my mum's Palestinian, and in 2018, uh, I took her back to the Holy Land. She left as a seven-year-old, as a, as a refugee, and uh, she was 77 at that time. So 70 years later... And one of the places we got to go to was Mount Carmel. So that's me on Mount Carmel uh, and looking, looking down uh, over, over the port town below. And it's the site uh, of this incredible battle between Elijah and not one prophet of Baal, but 450 prophets of Baal. And the challenge was to see who could call down fire for their sacrifice. And Baal was supposedly the god of weather. Uh, so you'd think, you know, he'd have a pretty good head start. And Elijah let them go first. And he basically trash-talked them the whole time they were trying to call down fire. Now, yeah, where's your god? Is he asleep? Is he on the toilet? Uh, he kept taunting them. And they tried all morning to call down fire and no go. Then Elijah stepped up to the plate. He actually drenched the sacrifice in water, uh, which is the opposite of what you would want to do to start a fire, apparently. Uh, and he soaked it multiple times and then called down fire from heaven. And it didn't just burn the sacrifice, it actually burnt the stones around the fireplace. And even the soil was charred and the water was just licked up by the flame. So he just wiped, wiped the floor with them and uh, almost literally did that, because after that, he had all of the prophets of Baal killed. But Jezebel found out about it and committed to killing Elijah. In 1 Kings 19.2, which Helen read to us, it says, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that one of one of them. And he fled in fear. He, he was terrified and he ran for his life. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. He was just at the end of his rope. He literally wanted to die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Man, that's as low as it gets. He'd had this incredible victory with the power of God and now he, he literally wanted to die. And he'd effectively taken his eyes off of God. Reminds me of Peter uh, walking on the water. You know, Peter tended to act first and think later, and he just stepped off the boat and walked towards Jesus. 
And he was doing well until he looked at the waves and the wind and took his eyes off Jesus and he started to sink. You know, Elijah had not only done the miracle at Mount Carmel. Uh, earlier, he'd brought a boy back to life. Uh, he'd called the drought and then later stopped the drought. Amazing things. And yet he succumbed to the fear of a human. The people had turned on the prophets of Baal. They were really primed to follow Yahweh. But Elijah fled. Chris's message a couple of weeks ago uh, talked about us being more worried about fear of others than of God. And one translation also highlights the fact that Elijah was probably despondent. He'd done this miraculous thing and Jezebel's heart was not touched at all. Rather than thinking maybe this Yahweh is the real deal, she just wanted to kill the prophets of Baal. And fear is a huge thing. Uh, In team, the mission that I serve with, we recently released a theology of risk. We actually spent time considering risk and what level of risk was acceptable as we seek to take the gospel, as we send families to, to dangerous countries, as we make decisions on when to pull them out. So we've, you know, we've had workers in places like Afghanistan, uh, in incredibly dangerous places, places where there's been natural disaster. Uh, on the next slide, uh, this is a couple called the Rubishes. He's American and she's German. And uh, recently, we were having to talk through with them about the crisis in Sri Lanka. Uh, You would have probably seen some images of uprising. The economy was just a mess. People ripped off the gates of the palace and stormed it. They were swimming in the presidential pool. And we had to talk through with them, was it safe for them to be there? Thankfully, they were in the city of Kandy, uh, which is where that photo was taken, so a bit further away. But they went through an earlier crisis. There was a civil war with the the Tamils, a minority group, and the Sinhalese, the majority group. And while they were living in Kandy, there was bands of of rebels that were going through the streets, killing off people they saw as targets. So politicians, the Rubishes were one of the, the few Westerners there. And so there was concern for their safety. And they got a phone call from a friend saying, there's a band of guerrillas headed, headed your way. Uh, be, be on guard. And, and not much longer after they hung up, they heard gunfire. And just the crack of a gun. And they, they all dove under the kitchen table. And they continued to hear these cracks of gunfire. And they were there for some time when Ted decided to creep out and see what was going on. And uh, as, as he crept out, he passed the open freezer door and the cracking was actually ice defrosting <laughs> in, in the freezer. Um, so that, that was a case of unwarranted fear. But, but generally, uh, they, they had some reason to fear. On the next slide uh, is a place called Merauke, which is in Indonesian Papua. Uh, so what used to be called Irian Jaya. Merauke is actually really close to Darwin, uh, close, close to the top of the York Peninsula, even more so. And uh, flying there this time, I'd taken eight flights to get there. I'd stopped at another city on the way. And uh, I got off that plane onto that tarmac, and you walk into like a shed to get your baggage. And there's a conveyor belt, and they have these porters in uniform, and they want you to pay the money literally to lift your bag off, off the conveyor belt. And I, I thought I was, I was reasonably capable of doing that. And so I was bending over my backpack, putting my passport back in, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw this guy in uniform coming towards me, and I waved him off, and I said, I'm fine, thank you. And he said, you need to come with me. And I looked up, and it was an immigration officer, and I'd just given him the brush off, <laughs> saying, get lost, mate. And so he, he marched me off to a part of the airport I'd never been before, uh, into this uh, imposing looking room and when I got there there's a pretty angry looking Indonesian guy and uh, he wanted to see my passport and sort of ripped it open and I, I had no idea how this was going to go and my Indonesian's probably about as good as Jason's Farsi and uh, the only guy I knew that could speak Indonesian was waiting for me outside of the airport and he found my visa and said yeah that's fine and then asked if he could have a selfie with me they don't get many foreigners there. Um, but, but my first reaction was fear. 
You know, I've, I've seen God do amazing things, uh, but my instant reaction was, was fear. So uh, it's, it's hard to be too critical of Elijah because all of us find situations where we're anxious and fearful. But the next thing we see is God's provision for Elijah. He was gracious and he was tender. Uh, he knew his needs and he met his needs. I want to show you a clip about meeting somebody's needs. The truck driver eating the Mars bar uh, was, was trying to help out. He thought the guy wanted the car pushed off the cliff, but he was just trying to, trying to stretch. Um, but God, thankfully, uh, does know us. He knows us better than we know ourselves, and he provides uh, for our basic needs. And in this case, Elijah, he was just spent, and what he needed was food and rest. And God stepped in when he had nothing. He was burnt out, he was terrified, and he wanted to die. And God at that point could have challenged him about his lack of faith, uh, about the fact that he just panicked and ran, but instead he met his needs. You know, earlier on in 1 Kings 17, after Elijah just dramatically appears on the scene and calls down a drought, God told him to flee at that point. Point. And he did. He, he ran away. And God sent him ravens with bread and meat twice a day. That's pretty mind blowing. Um, and he had him near a brook with fresh water. Now, this was pre Uber Eats, and um, God had this delivery thing nailed. But after fleeing from Mount Carmel, an angel brought him bread baked over hot coals and water. I'm guessing that. It, Bread tasted pretty good. Fresh bread supplied by angels. And he had that twice. Uh, when, when we go down to Victor, we love going to Port Elliot Bakery. And uh, during the holidays in particular, there's always a lineup, particularly at the Christmas holidays, but we always think it's worth the wait. But Port Elliot Bakery would have had nothing on this bread baked over hot coals by angels incredibly compassionate and tender of God that he would supply his needs so directly. You often hear uh, in TV shows and just generally, you know, people talk about often their mum bringing them hot chicken soup or, or a friend bringing them hot chicken soup. And chicken soup's great, but I, I don't know that its healing powers are so outstanding that that's exactly what you have to have when you've got a cold. It's, it's the heart behind it, you know, that somebody cares enough that they made this soup for you. Uh, they actually took action. And God took really direct action to meet the most immediate needs that he had. There's a French romantic writer and politician in the 1800s, a guy called Victor Hugo. And he wrote, go to sleep in peace, God is awake. Go to sleep in peace, God is awake. That's, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? We can sleep peacefully because God is awake. Uh, I recently was in Thailand um, last month and I was helping to run uh, some member care, pastoral care training for our workers. And another lady was helping, helping us do that uh, called Lisa. And she shared a story about a missionary kid in Myanmar. And um, we have a family that, that we evacuated from Myanmar with young kids and, and those kids went, went through a lot but this, this little boy, uh, his, his dad died of COVID and he had a pretty severe case, a lot of respiratory problems and he needed oxygen and they actually got oxygen 
And sadly, the, the military found out that there was oxygen at this house. And so they came round and took the oxygen because they wanted it for themselves. And, and his dad passed away. And he was just a little boy. And uh, if everyone was treading on eggshells around him. They didn't want to upset him. So they wouldn't talk about his dad in front of him. And he said to this Lisa when she went to do a debrief, I just want to talk about my dad. And, and she listened. She listened for a long time as this little boy just recited memories of his dad. You know, she, she found out what, what he really needed and she met that need. And sometimes for us, we feel we need to work it all out. We feel like we're on our own, that we can't show our emotion. But in the same way God calls out to Elijah, he calls out to you tenderly. He loves you and wants to comfort you lovingly and tenderly. And we're foolish if we don't turn to him. Isaiah 66, 13 sums it up beautifully. It says, as one whom a mother comforts, so I will comfort you. We can go to him in prayer. We can let him know what troubles us. And we can be still before him and let him comfort us. And finally, as well as God's provision, we see God's presence. He revealed himself. He showed himself uh, in a way that was both powerful and intimate. Elijah travelled 40 days to Horeb. That's a significant number in the Bible, to the mountain of God. It's also called Mount Sinai, and it's where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And it's interesting that in English, it says Elijah was staying in a cave, and in the original text in Hebrew, it says he was staying in the cave, which is probably a reference to the one where God appeared to Moses. And God asks him, what are you doing here? In verse 9. And Elijah's answer, he's dejected, and he says he's done God's will, but all God's prophets have been killed by the sword, and now they want to kill him. And God then reveals himself. So I'll get you to start. No, we, we probably don't need to do that again, but that was a good illustration. And not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in a still, small voice. And that's such a contrast to God doing the spectacular at Mount Carmel. Such a contrast to the, the wind and the earthquake and the fire. He's both a powerful God, but he's also an intimate God. And sometimes we have this image of a remote, distant, powerful God, but he's also powerful and intimate. An author called Paul Maxwell said, rest isn't measured in hours or minutes, but in proximity to God. It's not about time, it's about closeness to God. And we find true rest in God's presence. Elijah needed to be in the presence of God, and God spoke to him. And he again asks what Elijah is doing there in verse 13. And Elijah is given fresh direction by God. He's, he's given the opportunity to rest and recover and then recommissioned, including a successor, Elisha. Albert Einstein, who's one of the uh, smartest guys to have lived with one of the worst uh, hairstyles someone has lived with, he, he gave this quote, he said, a ship is safe in the harbour, but that's not what it's designed for. Which is interesting, Elijah really needed that time. Uh, he needed that rest. He needed that recovery. But God sent him out, recommissioned him. He recognises the need for rest, but also to have a purpose. And at the very end of Elijah's story, he's actually taken up to heaven. Him and Enoch are the only humans not to die. And for us, we need to come into his presence. Uh, in team, we use uh, a model of member care called the best practice model. Not a very creative name. That's just on the next slide there. And uh, I noticed Maddie had a shirt, Note to Self, um, Practice Self-Care, which I love, Maddie. That's great. That's really important. And at the very centre is, is master care, is our relationship with God. If you're struggling or you're struggling or helping someone else who's struggling, that's the starting point. And then flowing out of that is self-care, mutual care, caring for each other, and specialist care, doctors, psychiatrists, 
counsellors, people like that. You know, this little boy that I talked about in Myanmar, one of the things he was really sad about was that he was forgetting his dad's face. Um, he couldn't really remember as clearly what his dad looked like, uh, which is really tragic. S sometimes we forget that God's there. We can come before God, but often choose not to or forget to. Intimacy him, with him is so special and so necessary. And as we reflect on the challenges of the past year and realise that there'll be challenges in the year ahead, we need to look to God's power and God's presence. He wants us to increasingly come into his presence. He wants to provide for us intimately and tenderly. He has the power to get us through any situation. And I imagine there's those of you today that have got situations that are difficult or working with someone else that is. My goal this year is to look to God first. I too often look at how I can solve a problem in my strength which is a foolish thing to do when I can turn to him. But it's also so important and also wonderful to remember that when I fail, when I fear, he wants to be there for me and he cares deeply for me and for you. May we remember that and remind each other of that. May we direct ourselves to him and point others to him in 2023. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, Lord. We just thank you that we can learn from people like Elijah, Lord. He was somebody you used in mighty ways and he was both faithful but like us, there was times when he feared, times when he just was washed out, times when he literally wanted to die, Lord. Lord, I just pray for us in 2023 that we would look to your provision, Lord. We would embrace your tenderness and compassion as we need it, Lord, that we would point others to that, Lord, those that may not know you, that we would have the opportunity to share about you. And Lord, we also pray that we would come into your presence, Lord, and that we would look to you first in 2023. Pray for that as a church. And Lord, we just pray for uh, our brothers and sisters serving you in other churches. And particularly this morning, think of Glen Osmond Baptist, Lord, and ask for your blessing on them and for Peter as he starts his ministry there. And also for, for Laura and Micah and Grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Owen. What a, a great way to focus ourselves as we head into 2023. I wonder how you respond, how you're feeling inside as you hear what is perhaps a challenge, perhaps an encouragement, depending on, on where you're sitting. Are you, do you feel as though you've got this year together and you could probably do it by yourself? Or do you feel as though you don't know how you're going to do this year? And God's word for us this morning is that the same answer for both, that his presence, his love, his tenderness is with us, that his power, that his enabling is with us. And whatever we do with this year, let's not do it by ourselves. Let's do it by trusting, holding on to God, by enabling him to work through us and by receiving what he has for us. Now we're going to sing a song which can kind of be, I'd like us to see if we can make it a dedication. It's a song that talks about how our worth, who we are, is completely invested in who Jesus is and his death for us on the cross. And so I'd encourage you to sing it this morning as a dedication of yourself and of your year um, to God this morning. Let's stand together. And we'll take up our collection for Engage Work Faith. Thank you, Ushers. That would be great.
you alone. You alone bring us presence. You alone bring us power. And Lord, we would be stupid to head out without you. Please hold us to what we have promised to you today. Please enable us to live the way you have called us to live. Enabled by you, with you present with us and with you working through us. We dedicate ourselves to you. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. from Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen to that.